Amendment when in 2003 following the Le Electricity Marketing Governance Committee recommendation. Mr. Speaker, that's nine years and seven ministers later. My question to the Premier, why does government refuse to allow renewable to retail in Nova Scotia? Honourable the Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have uh, outla outlined uh, for all Nova Scotians the electricity plan um, uh, for the province. It sets out uh, some uh, one, uh, the potential for some $1.5 billion of investment uh, in our province through renewable projects. There are many different streams uh, for that. It provides the best opportunity for the development of renewables uh, into the grid. Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, it allows the monopoly with only access into this province and, re and does not allow Nova Scotians, Mr. Mr. Speaker, to have a choice when it comes to purchasing their power. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the Electricity Marketing Com Governance Committee made a recomm recommendation 51, was accepted, applauded throughout the energy sector, except by Nova Scotia Power. This government, like the previous Conservative government before that, has stalled implementation of this recommendation for a decade. Businesses want renewable energy. Residents want renewable energy, Mr. Speaker. Nova Scotians want renewable energy, Mr. Speaker, but this government simply won't supply them. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier, why is the Premier refusing Nova Scotians the opportunity to buy green renewable energy from other sources besides Nova Scotia Power? Honourable the Premier. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, there has been no uh, broader uh, application of uh, renewable energy uh, guidelines than those put in place by this government. We have brought on more renewable energy than any government before us. And Mr. Speaker, a few weeks ago, on a Saturday night, 30 percent of all of the electricity in Nova Scotia came from wind power. Yeah. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker. And it came through Nova Scotia Power, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, and Nova Scotians are paying through the nose to receive that energy from Nova Scotia Power, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Premier doesn't get it. It's quite simple. All we're asking to is to allow to open up the market, to allow renewable energy producers to sell directly to customers, Mr. Speaker. It's called breaking the monopoly and giving consumers choice. So my final question to the Premier. Will the Premier move the Liberal bill, which has allowed, which has been tabled six times in this house, which will allow renewable to retail in Nova Scotia? Yeah. Honourable the Premier. Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, we have seen attempts at deregulation take place across this province, Mr. Speaker. This is what the Liberal Party wants to see. They, they want to see what happened in Ontario where bills went up by 30 percent, Mr. Speaker. They want, they want to see. They want to see what happened now in Alberta, Mr. Speaker. So, for the information of the Leader of the Opposition, I, I want to read to him what his colleague said in Hansard back in November of 2002. This is Dalton, now Premier Dalton McGuinty. He said, now that there is a broad consensus right across the country that this has been one of the most glaring examples of gross mismanagement and incomp incompetence, why not admit it? De deregulation is dead, the market is dead, and your experiment is an abject failure, Mr. Speaker. That is what the Liberal Party wants for Nova Scotians. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. Mr. Speaker, last Friday, Capital Health Local 42 ratified their agreement with the government, so there is now an agreement. The Premier has either calculated the full cost of that agreement to the government, or he has not. And if he has not, then we have a bigger problem than him refusing to share the cost of that agreement with all Nova Scotians. And so I'll ask the Premier today, now that there is an agreement in place, now that the vote is done, now the agreement has been ratified by the local, will he now commit to sharing with Nova Scotians the full cost of that agreement, including all benefits, pensions, and other concessions that may have been made to reach this point. Honourable the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, as uh, the leader of the Conservative Party would know, it's still in the hands of an arbitrator, and, and uh, that decision will actually affect the, the cost of the province. But I can tell him in general terms, I didn't do that last week because, of course, the matter was still up for uh, ratification. Uh, and, and if there was no ratification, then, then everything uh, would have been uh, out, the, out the window and we would be essentially starting again. 
but the, the cost in that local will range anywhere between $3.3 million and $4.9 million, depending on, of course, the, dis the decision that the arbitrator, uh, uh, the arbitrator makes uh, on the positioning of those, uh, of those percentages. Honourable the Leader of the Official Opposition on his first supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're making some progress, and I want to thank the Premier for sharing those numbers finally with all Nova Scotians. Of course, he's speaking only about that one particular local, but as he would know from his own experience, that will be multiplied across many other bargaining units because that is the lead bargaining unit that sets the pattern for these kind of arrangements. But in the case of this particular local in Capital Health, Mr. Speaker, the negotiation was led by David Collins. It was assisted by Provincial Conciliator John Greer. The negotiations continued right up until the end, Mr. Speaker, and over 500 surgeries were cancelled and many other procedures were either scrapped or postponed. All eyes were on the negotiating team right up until the last minute as the pressure was on to reach an agreement to avoid a strike. But we don't know, Mr. Speaker, is what involvement the Premier or his office may have had in other discussions with Local 42 that got us to this point. So I'd like to ask the Premier to share with this House and all Nova Scotians what discussions may have gone on outside of the official no negotiations between his office uh, and Local 42. Honourable the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, negotiations take place uh, on uh, the basis of, um, of confidentiality as, uh, uh, as was pointed out uh, over the course of the negotiations uh, with, uh, uh, with the blackout. Uh, blackout. Of course, frequently um, uh, things like the negotiating mandate, those kinds of things come back uh, uh, to uh, the government for, um, uh, for commentary and, and support if necessary. Um, uh, what I want Nova Scotians to know is that the management of the, of the um, uh, health negotiations were carried out um, in a very professional manner. They were done uh, with purpose. They, they followed a predictable a course, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we have uh, a, a result which is satisfactory to the government. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party on his final supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, all Nova Scotians know the, uh, what happened at the official negotiating table. They followed it very closely. They followed the uh, actions of Mr. Collins and the conciliator in this example. What they don't know is what other discussions behind the scenes might have been going on between the Premier's office and Local 42. And with respect, with answers like that, I guess we'll never know. Mr. Speaker, uh, Capital Health is budgeted for a 1% increase. Uh, as uh, the pattern had previously been set uh, under direction of the government, but we now know the settlement is going to be many multiples of that. The CEO of Capital Health has said that they expect the government to fund any increase uh, beyond the 1%, as we know there now will be. So my question to the Premier, my final question, will the government be providing the extra funding as a result of the extra concessions to Local 42 to Capital Health, and if not, what programs does he expect them to cut to pay for the difference? Honourable the Premier. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, the, the district health authorities have uh, made their budget proposals uh, on the basis of a 1% uh, cost to them of new, uh, new contracts. They, of course, will expect that that will be supported, and it, and it will be, but we will be in uh, conversation with the district health authorities uh, on, uh, on, this, on this matter, and again, uh, this depends on, um, on uh, the decision of the arbitrator. As you would know, um, we anticipate uh, these uh, uh, matters in advance. Uh, we set aside money to fund uh, um, uh, contract negotiations, and, uh, and uh, before uh, those kinds of decisions can be fully made, we would have to know what the extent of the cost would be. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, power rates have soared. People are struggling, businesses are closing, Mr. Speaker, and the NDP continue to pass the buck to the Utility and Review Board. Okay. Government's lack of action is forcing Nova Scotians to decide between keeping the heat on, Mr. Speaker, or feeding their families. And go government is clearly out of touch with the reality of Nova Scotia families. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier, why is government content to hide behind the URB as Nova Scotians struggle to pay their power bills? <laughs> Honourable the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, far from it. Uh, this uh, government has been as active uh, or more active than uh, governments over the last 20 years. We have put in place a comprehensive, a comprehensive 
um, uh, uh, renewable energy strategy that is designed to create stability uh, in energy pricing. Uh, we have uh, taken uh, the HST uh, off of home energy, something that was uh, voted against by the Liberal Party. If they had their way, uh, home energy costs would be even higher. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his first supplementary. He's been active, all right. Power bills have gone up more than by 20 percent under his leadership, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, not to mention the NDP electricity tax, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the government is not fond of discussing their NDP electricity tax. A tax, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, they opposed before coming into office, Mr. Speaker. Government's demand side management fee is costing Nova Scotians $40 million, Mr. Speaker. That's $40 million directly attached to the NDP electricity tax that's coming out of the pockets of Nova Scotians, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Yeah. This government is dire clearly directly responsible for those increases in the power bills. My question to the Premier, why does he continue to sit idly by as Nova Scotians struggle to pay their power bills by adding this tax? Honourable the Premier. Uh, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, first of all, there's, there's, the, there is no NDP electricity tax. It was the NDP that took the tax off of electricity. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's got to get that, uh, that right. Now, Mr. Speaker, the, what, what he is talking about, though, is the demand-side management charge. And as a result of the demand-side management charge, there has been an investment in Nova Scotia that has saved um, a tens of millions of dollars for consumers. It has resulted in a $40 million do investment in the economy that allowed uh, uh, that, uh, that allowed uh, uh, companies to uh, to uh, create jobs in the province. This has been very successful, and I cannot believe the Liberal Party that used to be one time long ago used to be the champions of conservation now don't want it to happen. The leader of the official opposition on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I can understand why the Premier doesn't want to talk about the NDP electricity tax, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, because it is a direct charge on every power bill in the province of Nova Scotia that is directly responsible by the Premier of Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as a matter of fact, and I, Mr. Speaker, in 2009, to a letter to the Utility Review Board, the NDP wrote, Mr. Speaker, and I quote, it places the burden of the DSM-related improvements too heavily on residential users and other rate classes, end of quote. Mr. Speaker, later in the letter went on, and I quote, this surcharge on the power bills at this juncture would add unneeded and counterproductive costs to residential and business users, Mr. Speaker, end of quote. And I want to add to you, Mr. Speaker, since then, power rates have gone up by more than 20 percent since that crew got into power, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this is a tax on the poor and middle class in this province. So my question to the Premier, why does the Premier believe that Nova Scotia should pay the NDP electricity tax instead of Nova Scotia Power shareholders? Yeah. Honourable the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I just keep reminding the Leader of the Opposition that it's the NDP that took the tax off of electricity. It was something that they opposed, Mr. Speaker. If they had their choice, Nova Scotians would be paying even more for electricity than, than they are. The reason why electricity costs have gone up is because we have a utility uh, that over the years has been shackled to the price of fossil fuels, Mr. Speaker. And as a result of that, as a result of bad decisions made by former governments, both Liberals and Tories, we are stuck with the utility that we have. But they are changing, Mr. Speaker. They are changing with a better portfolio mix, with more renewables, so that we can have stable power rates into the future. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you. Um, you know, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And... Uh, my question is for the Minister of Energy, and of course, we've just heard the Premier, as usual, the government line, let's stand behind the URB and allow power rates to cripple this province and cripple Nova Scotia. Power rates are up almost 50% in the last 10 years, and over 20% since these guys took power. Mr. Speaker, yet this government still stands idly by why the power monopoly gouges Nova Scotians despite the fact that in opposition they opposed it. In October 2006, the Premier spoke out against Nova Scotia Power and the URB taking these controls saying, quote, the URB has to ensure Nova Scotians are being given accurate information and they aren't being asked to pay for the mistakes that are made by Nova Scotia Power. He's fine for, them paying for the, us paying for the mistakes of Nova Scotia Power today. So, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> will the Energy Minister please 
It, it, would, the, would the Minister of Energy please tell us why his government is not taking action to prevent power rate increases when the NDP demanded such action repeatedly in opposition? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And certainly uh, we're all concerned about the rising costs of uh, doing business, about the rising cost of electricity for consumers. And, um, you know, this government has taken uh, action, considerable action, to uh, reduce the price uh, uh, or to work to keep it down as reasonable as possible. We've uh, got the Keep the Heat program. We've uh, uh, reduced the provincial portion of the HST off of electricity. We have the Comfit program. We have the uh, REA plan for uh, renewables. Um, we're working through the Good Neighbor Energy Program. There's just a whole lot of initiatives that this government has brought in, and uh, we'll continue it in uh, Chapter 2, I'm sure. For Dartmouth East on his first supplementary. The record of this government is record profits for Amira being taken out of the pocketbooks of Nova Scotians. The record of this government is a tax on every Nova Scotian for conservation instead of having shareholders pay that. That is the record of this government on power, and it's a poor record, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, in October 2008, the NDP were concerned about rate increases. They said, quote, it will soon make a real difference in the standard of living for most hardworking families from one end of this province to the other. They then added, quote, the board, this being the Utility and Review Board, should ensure that every cent Every cent of higher profit should be used to help moderate rate increases, end quote. And I'll table that. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister of Energy. The NDP demanded that Nova, Scotia's power, Nova Scotia Power's profits be used to lower power bills in 2008. What's changed? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I mentioned in my first answer, we have taken a number of initiatives, uh, including taking the HST off electricity, which this, which, uh, this member's party uh, supported at the time. Uh, we've uh, worked hard to get off of uh, fossil fuels. It's gone down from more than 80% use under the previous government today. It's co getting closer to 50%. We're uh, working hard on getting renewables. Uh, we're working on through Efficiency Nova Scotia on a number of good programs that will save Nova Scotians uh, money. And uh, so there's a number of good initiatives, including uh, savings to Nova Scotians under the uh, uh, demand side management of somewhere around $100 million is what Nova Scotians will save under the auspices of that program. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, it's pretty clear that the NDP don't even understand how energy in this province works. Earlier we heard the Premier claim that we were for deregulation when in fact opening when in fact opening opening the renewable energy market is not deregulation and already exists in other provinces that are regulated. The minute the Premier doesn't even understand it. It's hilarious. Mr. Speaker. The fact is, in 2008, the man who is now the Transportation Minister accused the URB of being cozy with Nova Scotia Power and the major players in the province's energy market. Let me table his quote, where he said, quote, the URB will look at this, they'll probably listen to the interveners, but I'm thinking they'll say the major players have done their homework, let's kiss this deal goodbye and move on to the next issue, unquote. So, Mr. Speaker, my question for the Energy Minister, why are you hiding behind the regulatory body of the Utility and Review Board when the NDP once said that Review Board was in bed with Nova Scotia Power? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we all know that deregulation doesn't work. We've seen that happen in Alberta, in Ontario, in California, in uh, uh, Maryland, and elsewhere. It's done nothing but drive up the price of electricity. But I mentioned earlier the great programs that are being implemented under Efficiency Nova Scotia, and even uh, one of your colleagues agrees with that. I want to read this quote, Mr. Speaker, from the Honourable Member from Preston. Order, order, please. I'm having a hard time hearing the Minister. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'm trying to figure out where the uh, Liberal Party is coming from because uh, we're getting good support from the Honourable Member for Preston, and he, he reads uh, at the Public Accounts Committee, and I quote, I want to thank you and your staff for the fantastic job you were doing working with Nova Scotians to make life more affordable here, while at the same time other factors are creating a great deal of financial grief for people. I want to commend you and your staff and the work you've done with my constituency office, too, to help local constituents. So where, where is the Liberal Party coming from?
The Honourable Member for Cape Breton West. Please, order. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton West has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question to you will be to the Minister of Community Services. On April the 26th, the Minister of Community Services told reporters that the review of Talbot House was no different than that of the Braymore home. The minister said, and I quote, this report is no different than any other organizational review. You can go back to Braymore Review and you'll have specific questions asked there of specific staff members, identifying them in their roles. And I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. The fact is, that's not true. The report on the Braymore home does not contain one single statement, Mr. Speaker, identifying specific people. My question through you to the Minister is, will the Minister admit that there was no comparison between the two, that she broke the law, and it's time for her to resign? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Uh, Mr. Speaker, no matter how many um, ways that that member and the party twist the facts, we did the right thing. And we received advice and that advice was that we were able to um, we were able to take that review and put it on the website. That is no different than what has happened in the past. We review those very carefully, and obviously, once again, they're not reading that review. It does not say anything on an individual. It talks about the executive director and the staff and the and the shareholders and the board. That's it. It's an organizational review. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton West on his first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And you know, although he may not be named by name, there's only one executive director, and I don't think it's a far reach to figure out who that person is that that minister and that party and that government keep talking about time after time. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Order, please. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton West has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last February, the Minister informed Nova Scotians that the review of the Braymore home would be made public, and I will table that document. As a result, terms of reference were laid out on April the 1st 2011 between the Department and Deloitte. In those terms of reference, Deloitte agreed to, and I quote, col receive, collect, use, hold, and disclose personal information in compliance with all laws to such personal, personal information. And I will table a copy of the references that I've just made. Deloitte followed this agreement. They did not disclose any identifiable traits that could be directly linked to one single staff or board member. The minister claims a FOIPOP prompted her to publicize Talbot House Review, yet she did not ensure that the personal information was redacted. My question to her is this, through you, Mr. Speaker, why was the minister so careless in her decision to release the report without redacting all identifying information? Will she finally admit she has broke the law and it is time for her to resign. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Mr. Speaker, I'll say it over and over again. It is not personal information. It's organizational information. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton West on his final supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there is no comparison between the review on the Braymore home and the review of Talbot House. The minister has been carrying up, comparing apples and oranges. Both reviews were brought on by an incident or an allegation. At the Braymore, an investigation was conducted by the department, followed by a report that was kept confidential.
Then Deloitte did their public review, which contained no personal information. At Talbot House, a confidential review was conducted, then released to the public. The terms of reference laid out for Deloitte clearly indicates they could not release any personal information and must follow the FOIPOP Act, and they did, Mr. Speaker. The disclaimer of the Talbot House states, report states, and I quote, the report contains confidential and identical and personal information. This release violates the FOIPOP Act, Mr. Speaker. My final question, will the minister finally admit that her department had no business breaking the law to publish this report on Talbot House, and will she resign and do the right thing? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to remind the member opposite that when his party was in government, that the member from Argyle, as Minister of Community Services, released a review on a shed -a camp. That particular review was an internal review. That particular review references the executive director, and I will table this, and it was done in January 2009 when he was Minister of Community Services. The Honourable Member for Glace Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The NDP government has announced that they are moving 93 jobs across the province. 34 from agriculture, 22 from fisheries, 12 from aquaculture, along with 25 from justice. Of course, Mr. Speaker, there is support for the decentralization of these jobs, these 93 jobs. As we all know, Mr. Speaker, that's 93 jobs, but more importantly, it's 93 families. So certainly the, the communities that are impacted will appreciate the, the decentralization of these jobs, no question. But many would wonder about the cost of the taxpayers, Mr. Speaker. So my question to the minister responsible for the Public Service Commission, will he give Nova Scotians the entire, the entire cost projections of the relocation plan? Good question. The Honourable Minister of the Public Service Commission. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, there will be some implications, but we will not know the, the real cost until we find out uh, how, how many employees are going to, to move and uh, how many will, will uh, decide to, to stay here in the area and bump locally. So uh, we will, uh, we, when, when we have that number, I'll be more than happy to give it to the member and all members of this House, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Glace Bay on his first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Moving civil servants across the province cannot come without a cost, Mr. Speaker, so it's hard to imagine uh, that th these 93 jobs will be cost neutral. There are obligations involved with posting families to new communities, and it's important that Nova Scotians have a full view of what the financial obligations will be. In addition to the cost of posting families, consolidating maintenance enforcement officers in a single location could result in increased travel obligations as these officers are often required to appear in courts across the province. My question to the Minister of Justice. Will the Minister table in the House all financial information and projections regarding the transfer of personnel from his department to the community of New Waterford? The Honourable Minister of Justice. I, I want to thank... Order, order. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The essence of, the, of this move is to get better accountability within, uh, within the MEP, improve the service that I... And I I listen to the members across the floor and their advice that they give us and the recommendations they make, and they very clearly said to this minister and to this government they want to see improvement and a better streamline of service. And that's exactly what advice I took and moved forward. On the issue of the overall costing, when we determine as to who is actually going to move and from what distances and what impacts, we'll be able to make those costings. And just for the record, I'm not totally clear as to which members would appear in court for what reasons, but the member may have some information that I don't possess. The Honourable Member for Glace Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Included in the various costs around posting, uh, is an important question regarding the willingness of those personnel to actually accept the move and the provisions around that issue. For the government to indicate that these moves will be cost neutral is not entirely forthcoming. 
These additional costs could include staffing requirements if personnel declined to relocate instead of accepting positions elsewhere in government. So my question to the Minister responsible for the Public Service Commission, will the Minister explain what happens when a civil servant says they do not want to move? Will this restructuring exercise result in new personnel being hired to cover the moves? Honourable the Minister of the Public Service Commission. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a cost-neutral move, Mr. Speaker. That that there will be, Mr. Speaker, there will there will be cost in the front end when people are moving and so on. But I'll tell you what's not cost-neutral, Mr. Speaker. When the Liberals closed the pits in Cape Breton and sent them out to Alberta and Points West, Mr. Speaker, that wasn't cost-neutral. That darn near killed our island. Thank you. The Honourable, the Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It seems uh, things are quite testy in here today, so I, I, I order. And Jeff is standing up hollering. So I mean, let's let's just take a little uh, short, little uh, deep breath, relax. Okay, it's um... <laughs> well, it's becoming a bit heated in here. So I'd ask the members to take a deep breath, so we continue continue a good debate in the chamber in a nice parliamentary way. All right. So can I now recognize the honourable member for Victoria de Lakes? in a nice parliamentary way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You most certainly can. Mr. Speaker, last week we asked the Minister of Community Services to clarify her position on funding for private daycares. When asked about the department's decision to review early learning in Nova Scotia, she told this House that, and I quote, we have not said that profit wouldn't be a part of it. They're the ones who keep saying it, and I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, we have three news articles here where the minister clearly states that phasing out funding for private child care facilities is on the table, and I'll table that as well, Mr. Speaker. So my question to you, to the Minister of Community Services, can the minister give Nova Scotians a definitive answer about the future of private daycare facilities? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Mr. Speaker, I'll be clear. We never said that. All along, we have said we are working together with both the profit and the non-profit. It's another fabricated stories by the Tories. The Honourable Member for Victoria de Lakes on his first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today is Worthy Wage Day at many daycares across the province. Child care facilities, both private and non-profit, have access to wage enhancement grants for their staff. If the minister cannot clarify for certain whether funding will be available for the private sector, then the future of wage equality for those working in private daycare facilities is threatened. So my question through you to the minister, does the minister understand that phasing out the funding for private daycare centers would make them ineligible to receive enhancement grants? Is it her intention to make the owners and staff at 228 daycare centers uneasy. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Mr. Speaker, I don't know how I can be any more clear than what I've been saying is that there, we are working with both of those sectors and I have said in this host before that both of them are very valuable to us and that we need to have them as part of our future um, as we go forward and plan uh, with respect to uh, daycares and child development in this province. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes on his final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the minister has gone back and forth on her responses at least seven times. She has indicated that the government will be consulting both the private and the nonprofit sector as they try to formulate a plan for early learning in the province. We've seen this government's approach to the consultation process, Mr. Speaker. First contract arbitration was put in motion long before the LMRC was created. Needless to say, small business owners in the province have little reason to put their faith in this government. 
So, Mr. Speaker, my final question through you to the Minister. Will the Minister make the framework for their consultation process public before proceeding with any plans? Will she stop scaring daycares and parents with erratic flip-flopping? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Mr. Speaker, they're the ones who are, are scaring the daycares. We've been on the same page all along. We've, I've met with both organizations. We're talking about consultation. I know that that party over there does not even know the definition of consultation. And we are not going back and forth. We are opening up uh, the doors to all people of Nova Scotia in the future to talk to us about early childhood development and where the province and the people of Nova Scotia would like to see that go. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. Does the Minister of Energy believe that ratepayers in Nova Scotia should be responsible for paying the bonuses of Nova Scotia power executives? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and certainly um, we're all concerned about the cost of electricity and the, the demands on consumers and small businesses and in industrials. There are many factors that go into uh, determining that cost. And uh, you know the rate of return and the uh, cost, uh, the uh, cost to uh, executives is only a small part of what's considered by the UARB in determining what's fair and what's right and the best possible price for Nova Scotians. The honourable member for Dartmouth East on his first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since there wasn't a no, I'll take that as a yes that he does think uh, ratepayers should pay for it. You know, um, Mr. Speaker, the uh, the backroom de and Mr. Speaker, the minister well knows, and if he doesn't know this, he should come to public accounts tomorrow, where the uh, URB will be happy to clarify this for him. That the URB determines what's in rates based on what's in provincial legislation, which means, of course, that this minister has the ability to ensure that bonuses are never covered by ratepayers of Nova Scotia. So, Mr. Speaker, given that the minister has the legislative power to determine what the review board can even consider when it comes to rates, will the minister, uh, dr will the minister introduce legislation to ensure that ratepayers never cover executive bonuses in the future? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, through the uh, process in the Department of Energy and this government, we worked hard to bring down the uh, prices or hold them stable. We've taken the uh, provincial portion of the HST off of uh, electricity. We've uh, had the Keep the Heat program. Uh, we're working on conservation programs through Efficiency Nova Scotia. We have uh, built a, a, a strong uh, portfolio of renewables in this province around wind and biomass and, uh, and hydroelectricity. And uh, we've introduced natural gas. Unlike previous governments, it relied only on one thing, coal. That was all they, all they looked at. We've got a great diversity in, our, in this government. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East on his final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'll take that also as a no. Um, you know, Mr. Speaker, uh, this, isn't, this isn't complicated. Ministers said that they've been working hard to reduce rates. They've gone up more than 20% since they took office. I would hate to see, this go, see the rates in this province if they weren't working hard then. You know, I mean, Mr. Speaker, this is, it's absolutely ridiculous. There are all kinds of steps legislatively that this government could have taken to ensure that rates had not gone up by 20%. All kinds of steps. They could have ensured that the conservation programs and efficiency in Nova Scotia was paid by shareholders, just like they promised during the election, instead of downloading it to ratepayers. You know, Mr. Speaker... Since the, I've asked the minister twice, I'll give him a third chance to answer this very simple question. Does the minister believe that ratepayers in Nova Scotia should have to pay for the executive bonuses of Nova Scotia power executives? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, certainly standing still, like previous governments have done, is not an option for this government. And we've taken in many good programs to help Nova Scotians to stabilize energy prices. We're working with our partners in Newfoundland and Labrador to bring uh, stable electricity prices from the Muskrat Falls project. We'll continue to work with Efficiency Nova Scotia, continue to keep the HST portion off of uh, electricity, and again, work for the best possible prices for, for Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question to you is for the Minister of Communications, Nova Scotia. 
Now, we all know that this government has a love affair with advertising. For months, Nova Scotians have been treated to slick NDP television radio ads at the taxpayer's expense. Nova Scotians aren't fooled by these ads, Mr. Speaker. They know that they are worse off now than they were when this elect government was elected. My question through you to the minister is this. When will the minister responsible for CNS stop trying to hoodwink Nova Scotians with their own money and put an end to the NDP propaganda plan? The Honourable Minister of the Public Service Commission. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Communications, Nova Scotia. Uh, thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, we're not trying to hoodwink anybody. I think that the fact is, is that we, when you you try to tell, and the, and the opposition parties have said to us, they want us to, to tell Nova Scotians what programs are out there and so on. So I guess if they're against, if they're against telling people to get immunized and so on, then we're hoodwinking, Mr. Speaker. But I think not. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton West on his first supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I find myself in an odd place here. I'm kind of lost for words after hearing the likes of that. <laughs> but, Mr. Speaker, you know, almost all of these political ads are, uh, almost all of these ads are political in nature and could just as easily come from the New Democratic Party rather than the government of Nova Scotia. Nova Scotians pay taxes to pay for services. Pardon me? There you go. It appears that the ministers that aren't asking questions have all kinds of answers, but the ones that do don't know how to give an answer. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotians pay taxes to pay for services they need, not to pay for the NDP political advertising. So my question, my question is this to the minister. Will the minister produce the protocol his department uses to determine the line between political, but political advertising and public service announcements. The Honourable Minister of Communications, Nova Scotia. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, we don't have that protocol. Because we don't do political advertising, Mr. Speaker. We do advertising to inform the people of Nova Scotia of services that are provided by this great government, Mr. Speaker. That's what we do. We provide information to Nova Scotians so they'll know where to get services, Mr. Speaker. But the quote from a famous movie is, Mr. Speaker, they can't handle the truth. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton West on his final Well, Mr. Speaker, I can't really agree with that statement because we've never heard the truth come from that government, so we wouldn't know what it was. We won't raise taxes. Mr. Speaker, advertising on television, radio and internet, it's clear there is no limit to what this NDP government will do and what their propaganda machine will do to get their message out. On the taxpayer's dime, I might add, Mr. Speaker, on the taxpayer's dime. Mr. Speaker, the question is, will the minister commit today? Will the minister commit today to ensuring that the government will not use wireless technology to assault Nova Scotians with more blatantly political advertising? The Honourable Minister of Communications, Nova Scotia. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, okay, Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, let, let's let's start with a quote, and then I'll delve in. A quote from the member from Argyle. I I don't think government as a whole does a good does a good job of promotion. He said, "Not enough Nova Scotians know what kind of programs are out there." I don't think we spend enough time explaining or advertising or getting those programs out there. I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, but, Mr. Speaker, you want to talk about informing Nova Scotians. Mr. Speaker, they go on about the amount of money we spend. Mr. Speaker, it's 27% less than when those culprits or those bad guys, those very, very bad people, and I take back the word culprit, Mr. Speaker, I take that back. Mr. Speaker, those bad guys over there, that's what they spend, 27% more. The Honourable Member for Glace Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, 
that. Thanks. Mr. Speaker, data released by StatScan shows that Nova Scotia had yet another dismal year last year. The province's GDP grew by 0.3% last year, Mr. Speaker, under this great government. We can't wait to hear how the Liberals and the Tories are responsible for last year's failures in economic development. I'm looking forward to it, Mr. Speaker. Not only were we the second worst performing province, we were far behind the national economy, which posted a 2.6% growth, Mr. Speaker. Month after month, businesses in the province indicate that the ever-rising cost of power is one of their largest concerns, and our poor economic performance show that result. My question, what measures has the Minister of Economic and Rural Dever Development and Tourism taken to protect businesses from the increasing cost of electricity in the province of Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would refer that uh, question to the Minister of Energy. The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And certainly, uh, we as a department have worked with Efficiency Nova Scotia and a number of good programs there that uh, help small businesses and large businesses. And we're constantly working with uh, businesses of various sizes in the province to find the best possible energy rates for, for our businesses in, in uh, Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Glace Bay on his first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Businesses are having to deal with rising power costs far too frequently. It's another cost pressure that is making our economy uncompetitive, and the proof is no further than our, than our dismal economic growth last year. Manufacturing output dropped by 5.6 million, construction declined by 6.5%. Small and medium-sized businesses are being squeezed by an overall uncompetitive environment. However, business after business points to power as their very top concern, Mr. Speaker. So my question to the Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism, or whatever minister wants to read the bullets, why has the minister ignored the detrimental effects that rising power rates have had on our businesses and on the economy of Nova Scotia? <laughs> The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again, I would refer that uh, question to the Minister of Energy, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We certainly know the, the pressures that are faced by small businesses and, uh, in this province, and is it the rising cost of uh, volatile fuel prices is certainly, uh, certainly one of them. And, you know, coal prices have been up 75 percent in the last six years. This government has taken action to get away from that, to do something different than previous governments with a whole portfolio of renewables and conservation and natural gas and other initiatives. And uh, it's just years of inaction by previous governments that we're in the situation that we're in right now. The Honourable Member for Glace Bay on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, 0.3% growth in GDP is the result of a lack of understanding by the Minister on what businesses face in this province. While the national economy expanded by 2.6%, our province was virtually flat at 0.3% GDP growth, Mr. Speaker. The Minister must now realize the importance of setting targets and outcomes because the only measurable outcome of his performance is flat growth and the second worst economy in our country. So my question to the Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism, when will the Minister have a real strategy for economic growth, one with real targets, measurable outcomes, and a plan to address rising power rates in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm uh, more than pleased uh, to rise to my place and address that question. It's, it's, it's unfortunate, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I've made uh, a couple uh, invites uh, to the member opposite uh, to... Uh, to uh, to, uh, to come to my office. Uh, he could sit down with staff because what we wanted to do and what we're still willing to do, if he's willing to take us up, we want him to know what the Jobs Here strategy is all about. He doesn't fully understand the context of the Jobs Here strategy, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we inherited 20 years, 20 years of non-productivity in the province of Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we are on the right course. We are going to stay the course. We have turned this province around, Mr. Speaker. And he's more than welcome to come over so that he can get a full understanding and an appreciation of the jobs here. We want to take him out of the dark and into the light, Mr. Speaker.
The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is, uh, my question is for the Minister of Energy. You know, Mr. Speaker, the Premier and the Minister and his government generally have been very good at following the bullet points on the Lower Churchill project as a beacon of hope for energy costs in this province. In fact, some of the ministers have even said it would lower power rates and as good a project as it is, we know that that's certainly not going to happen. Now, we know that the Lower Churchill project has benefits. We know that the member for Annapolis was one of the people leading the charge before it seemed the Premier had even heard of Lower Churchill. However, it, what's strange... What's strange is that the, the Premier, the Premier and, and the Minister of Energy, the Premier and the Minister of Energy have been unable to answer basic questions about the project. Now, Nalcor has recently been quoted as saying that they will get a guaranteed rate of return of 8.4% from their ratepayers on the project. Mr. Speaker, an 8.4% rate of return is something many people would love to have on their investments. So, Mr. Speaker, would the Minister of Energy please tell us whether he plans to allow Amira and Nova Scotia Power to have a similar guaranteed rate of return on their portion of the project paid on the backs of ratepayers? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Speaker. And certainly, uh, you know, we're, this government is always looking at the uh, a portfolio approach to find different ways to, to bring uh, electricity to uh, consumers in this province at reasonable rates. And uh, as I mentioned in my previous answer, uh, you know, getting off of fossil fuels, getting off of coal, and certainly the Muskrat Falls project uh, provides Nova Scotians with uh, access to reliable power for 35 years that will help to stabilize prices here for, for, for that length of time. So it's a, it's a real vision of how to get off of fossil fuels and do something completely different that will help Nova Scotians in the long run. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East on his first supplementary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it strikes me the Minister just proved my point that all they can use is talking points and can't answer basic questions about the project. Uh, that's the same. It's the same talking points they've been using for a year on this without answering very basic questions. You know, that was about whether they would allow a rate of return. Mr. Speaker, during budget estimates, and I'll table the, the transcript from estimates on this, I asked the uh, minister repeatedly whether his department had actually done any cost analysis on the project in terms of the rate impact on Nova Scotians. You know, even in the proximate one, the minister said no, and I tabled that. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Why hasn't the Premier or his government taken the time to figure out the ultimate impact to ratepayers from this project? Honourable the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I, I would think the member opposite would know, uh, the costs associated with the, with the project uh, go through a number of decision gates where information comes in so that they have you know, the, co the cost of you know, everything from the construction to the cost of the, uh, of the line, all of those, uh, those things. And of course, it, it very much depends on the overall uh, structure of, uh, of, uh, of, of the cost. So in order to be able to determine um, the, the overall cost for ratepayers, you have to be able to de determine the overall cost structure to begin with. And since that hasn't happened yet, it's, uh, of course, uh, very difficult to be able to provide him with the information that he requires. Uh, however, I, I would indicate to him that, uh, you know, at the appropriate time when that information is fully available, then of course uh, we'd be more than uh, happy to uh, to uh, give him uh, that information. Uh, but it does uh, these projects, especially you know, extraordinarily large projects, are going to have. Uh, diverse economic benefits, not just for this province but for the entire region, uh, do uh, take time and they move along a rather measured and predictable course. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Well, Mr. Speaker, here's the problem with the Minister or the Premier's statement. In his news release of uh, November 18th, 2010, which of course I will table, the Premier repeatedly talks about how. Uh, lower Churchill project will deliver power at a rate that is initially higher than coal, but will then um, w w will balance out and makes all kinds of statements about how the cost will be good for Nova Scotians, and yet he doesn't know that. 
He doesn't know how it will compare to other elements. And these are important elements for Nova Scotians to understand and is one of the reasons why we've advocated for balancing this with energy from Hydro-Quebec. And here's why Nova Scotians are concerned. In Newfoundland, we've recently heard the price there might be as high as 23 and a half cents a kilowatt hour. The only price that has been floated in Nova Scotia is over 17 cents. Maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong. But the fact is, Nova Scotians are relying on the Premier to provide information about this important project. So, Mr. Speaker, would the Premier please tell Nova Scotians why his government did not analyze the potential cost to ratepayers before making the statements that he made in his own press release? Honourable the Premier. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, what we do know uh, is that the long-term benefits of the fixed price for 30 five years for uh, for energy uh, is something that is uh, we could only wish we had um, uh, access to today can you imagine mr. speaker paying for energy price prices at 1998 levels mr. speaker that's what the lower Churchill is going to bring uh, to ratepayers in Nova Scotia stable energy prices uh, for a percentage of the portfolio over the long term. Now, Mr. Speaker, in addition to that, in addition to that, because of the upgrade grades for tr uh, for transmission, it will also open up the regional energy market, which will allow the energy utility here to buy electricity on the open market and to get it at the lowest possible price, and then underwrite the cost of uh, of the power to Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, they can do it now, and they do. The Honourable Member for Hans West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. My, Mr. Speaker, uh, my question is for the Minister of Energy, and I'll get right to it. How much per kilowatt hour does the Minister of Energy think Nova Scotia families can afford to pay for their electricity bill? Okay. The Energy. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, speaker. Uh, certainly. Uh, Costs of electricity to uh, ratepayers, to consumers, to small businesses, to uh, industry is a uh, is a concern to all of us, and uh, we're, this government is working very hard to uh, find a mechanism that will, uh, through a portfolio approach, uh, whether it's uh, taking the HST off of uh, electricity or uh, look, working with Efficiency Nova Scotia on programs that will uh, reduce the cost to uh, ratepayers and small businesses, um, whether it's uh, switching from coal to natural gas or uh, looking at hydroelectricity or biofuels. We have our ComFit program. We have the REA initiative. There's just many varieties of uh, issues that we're working very hard to get the lowest uh, possible uh, cost of electricity to, uh, to uh, Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Hans West on his first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia Power submitted their capital expenditure plan to the UARB and it has come under some serious scrutiny for consumer advocates and interveners. Mr. Speaker, the Avon Group, representing industrial users of electricity, said when evaluating Nova Scotia Power's capital plan, there's nothing evident which demonstrates NSPI's recognition of the economic burden on its ratepayers. She went on to say the question of affordability is a critical one for Nova Scotians and I'll table that as I refer to it, Mr. Speaker. My question through you to the Minister of Energy is how much longer is the Minister going to refuse to study the affordability of his bite the bullet electricity plan and Nova Scotia families ability to pay for it. The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you. Uh, thank you Mr. Speaker. Certainly affordability is what this is, government is all about. Finding uh, a suite of uh, energy alternatives that will allow the lowest possible cost to uh, to a homeowner or to somebody that rents an apartment or a very small business in this province, maybe a large industrial company like a pulp mill or a sawmill. And we have a plan uh, that we're working that plan. It's really through a, a whole portfolio of uh, uh, issues, uh, whether it's uh, taking the tax off, whether it's uh, looking uh, to get away from coal, getting on to natural gas or to renewables. Uh, this, this government is a plan. We're working it hard and we're working in the best, uh, best interest of uh, Nova Scotians. And uh, I think in the end, we'll have a, a plan that's uh, most affordable for uh, Nova Scotia consumers, for small business and for large industrial complexes uh, in Nova Scotia. We have a plan. We're going to stick to it. Order, order, please.
The time allotted for all questions put by members to ministers has expired. Before I finish today on this very rambunctious question period, I always remind the honourable members in this chamber about the use of Blackberries, laptops and other electronic devices are not permitted during question period. Today during question period I observed at least six members of the chamber playing with their Blackberries during question period. Now as of tomorrow I will be asking the Sergeant of Arms to remove those Blackberries from the members in this chamber. So I suggest as of tomorrow if you don't want to be embarrassed you will shut your Blackberries off. The Honourable Member for Halifax Clayton Park on an introduction. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And last week I had the opportunity to uh, speak at the political science class at Halifax West High School. And I'm delighted that they've joined us today, just at the tail end of question period, but still they're with us today in the West Gallery. Um, and they are accompanied by their teacher, Christine Bullock. And I would ask that you rise and receive the warm welcome of the House. Thank you. <laughs> We welcome all our guests to the gallery, especially young people who are learning today's parliamentary procedures. I will now uh, recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, could you please call public bills for second reading? Public bills for second reading. Please call bill number 34, the Matrimonial Statutes Repeal Act. Bill number 34, the Matrimonial Statutes Repeal Act. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that Bill 34 now be read a second time. Mr. Speaker, it is my pleasure today to talk about Bill 34, the Matrimony Status uh, Statutes Repeal Act. The Matrimonial Statutes uh, Repeal Act uh, will uh, will repeal the Alimony Act, the Married Women's Deeds Act, the Married Women's Property Act, and the Court for Divorce and Matrimonial Causes Act, number one, two, and three. Mr. Speaker, these statutes are clearly outdated and unnecessary. This legislation has been sus sus uh, 